So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My, my name is Chris Garrett. I'm a professor for American Studies here. I'm currently on sabbatical, so it's lovely to see so many uh, faces that I recognize and, and other guests, and it's delightful that we have a full room tonight for a really special evening with, as uh, my colleague, uh, Gabriela pizas Ramirez said, our current Picador professor, Daniel Pena. And um, I'd just like to say a little bit about Daniel. Most of you know who he is and have seen uh, his background, but try, uh, despite that, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit about him, although one could obviously say a lot in terms of all the success he's had so far. He likes to describe himself as a writer, a reviewer, a journalist, and a blogger. Um, and indeed, he's, he's all those things, as you can see online. His debut novel, Bang, chronicles the fate of two brothers living on the border between Mexico and the USA. Um, and is being published by Arte Publico Press uh, this fall. Is it out already? Uh, January 30th. January 30th. Pushed it back. So yeah. we'll define fall 2017 liberally. So <laughs> yeah. Time and space. Pena has also written numerous. Um, Daniel has also written numerous short stories and essays for venues like Plowshares, Callahoo, and The Guardian, winning the Pushcart Prize in 19, 2017 for a short story, Safe Home, from which I think we're going to yeah. have something tonight, which is really really nice. Daniel holds uh, both Mexican and U.S. citizenship, speaks English and Spanish fluently, and has lived in Mexico City for a while before settling in Texas, where he teaches literature and creative writing at the University of Houston downtown, with whom we have a partnership, uh, Leipzig and, and the University of Houston. So, and there's members of, yes, members of the Houston Leipzig Sister City uh, um, uh, organization are here tonight. Previously, he's worked at Louisiana State University and at Cornell University, from where he graduated with a Master of Fine Arts in 2013. He has received grants and awards from Cornell University, as well as a Fulbright Scholarship to Mexico City, and has held fellowships and residencies at both Cornell and Texas A&M. In short, a very young man and a very distinguished young man in terms of his career so far. Why don't you join me, please, and welcome Daniel Pena to our reading tonight. I'm so glad to be here, and uh, thank you to Frederica and Krister and Jacob and Stefan and my students who are kind of shyly in the back. They're just like, oh, I'm just gonna sit way back here. Thank you guys for being uh, for for coming on a really cold night, um, and uh, you know all, all the people who are involved in this. You know, Picador, the DAAD, uh, and uh, Uni Leipzig. It's been uh, an incredible honor to uh, to teach these students. I was I was telling uh, Frederica earlier. It feels like I went from like a Ford Fiesta to like a Ferrari. It's like my students are like little professors and they're so brilliant and it's, it's been great. Um, I'm gonna read from Safe Home, which is an excerpt of the novel that's gonna come out in January. Um, and it's about um, two brothers who essentially are undocumented and they become uh, involved in this sort of black market once they're, they find themselves on the Mexican side of the border. And this particular chapter is about Cuauhtémoc, this, this pilot um, who, uh, is involved with this cartel and sort of he's always trying to plot his escape from the cartel and part of how he does that is he's trying to embezzle money from the cartel to sort of get enough money so that he can kind of have a little nest egg and leave. Um, in this chapter, and I'll read excerpts of it, um, is essentially Cuauhtémoc, um, the cartel finding out that Cuauhtémoc and his buddy Lalo um, embezzled the money and so uh, there's sort of repercussions. Uh, and I'll, I'll read this. This is called Safe Home. Quao always greases the landings. If the winds are strong, he lands in the desert north of Obregón on a sand strip outlined by burning tar barrels, desert oak and split saguaro cut lengthwise to catch the neon sun. But if the winds are calm, Quao lumbers his aircraft, an aging M20J, onto a neighborhood street in Lomas de Poleo, just inside Ciudad Juarez. All of the homes abandoned, everyone gone home from the drug wars. The neighborhood landing always warns 30 degrees of flaps. The elevators pop low with a shimmy dampener extended full to the hook and bolt, no further slack to give. The flexing tension of the wire pings up and down the length of the aircraft as it descends. You can hear it ringing like a bell from the sky from both sides of the border. From one hill, the ejercito, the Mexican military, gazing up with silent admiration for a pilot who can grease such a landing. From the other hill, the Americans looking down into the city with a fixed gaze, as if willing the cartel plane to crash. 
Quao dives in at an angle on a slipstream with his left rudder pushed full to the carpet and his ailerons turned fist over lap so that the plane falls fast and loud, the upgush of wind roaring high through the idle propellers. The plane, like a screaming vulture, descending crooked into the remnants of the neighborhood. 500 feet, 400 feet, and he'll kick out the rudder to right the plane just before impact. He'll land it clean and free onto a street named Nawal, where the crumbling tar gravel and rock splatter up against the nickel-plated underbelly of the plane behind the thrust of the, twin, of the cooling twin-flat eight Lycoming piston engines still revved to a thousand RPM. The wingtips, 48 feet from one tip to the other, scrape along the thresholds of the houses on either side of Nawal Street. The power lines roll up and stretch over the bump of the cockpit. All of the birds move to either end of the line, unimpressed by the smoking 450 horsepower engine threatening to suck them in. The driver, too, waits, unimpressed at the end of the road. The driver is always the one asking questions. The driver is both Quao's ride home and his interrogator, his friend and his enemy. How is the flight? Any messages to be relayed? Any peculiarities along the way? Are you sure? Are you sure, he'll ask, and Quao knows the routine. He knows better than to incriminate himself on what he did or did not see from the skies. The driver is always different, but more or less a variation of the same man. Mid-thirties, severely overweight, reeking of delicados and cheap sex and Tommy Hilfiger cologne, probably named Chewy, which is short for something Quao can never remember. From his cockpit, Quao can see the driver sitting back in his pleather-covered seats, drumming his nicotine-stained fingers on the steering wheel of the truck. He listens to the American radio pouring in from the station atop the hill. He hates Kesha. He loves Katy Perry. He checks his watch and waits for the engines to cut. He checks his hair in the mirror, perfectly lacquered with Tres Flores pomade. He cracks his spearmint gum. His breath smells like Swiss cheese. The man with purple boots lies unconscious in the safe house tub. His hair still tinged with the sulfury smoke of burnt diesel. His hands are smoked black and his eyes are two fiery coals peering out with a thousand yard stare. His name is Lalo and he's barely, barely breathing. He's soaking wet in his clothes, a blue pearl snap shirt, a pair of Wranglers, a pair of Larry Mayhands that have all but cracked the fiberglass wide open. Along the inside of the tub are long black arcs where the heels have scuffed in the struggle. The leather of his boots blow it about the same time his skin does. His fingers turn white and slough off their outer layer into the water. Quao's face turns ashen at the sight of Lalo, the man he'd purged from his mind only 30 minutes ago. A million thoughts course through Quao's brain just then, but none louder than the question. What happened? What's going on? He says Quao. He acts just as surprised as he should be, though, of course, he'd seen this coming from down the pike. There's a doctor sitting on the toilet in a white coat, RMP embroidered on his lapel. Across from him, there's a boy with blue tattoos up and down his arm. These beautiful Chinese dragons with red eyes. The boy is wearing jeans rolled up to his calves and a plastic green rosary that dips in and out of the pink water of the fiberglass tub. He seems to be holding Lalo down, or at least guarding him. The doctor checks Lalo's pulse, consults his watch, and then produces a capped needle from his breast pocket. He plunges the needle through the denim into the fleshy part of Lalo's thigh. Lalo's eyes spring open, the black of his pupils spreading like ink to chase the green of his iris away. I only fly planes, says Quao to the little man, staring up at him. The little man rubs his eyes and says, we need to know who else. We know you were close. We need to know who. I only fly planes, says Quao. He says it again and again. He keeps repeating it as if it might change something. Of course, Quao knew these things happened, but he never dreamed he'd ever be a part of it. He knows what's coming, and Lalo knows too. Everyone looks down on Lalo in the tub. The air is static. Lalo refuses to look anyone in the eye or speak for that matter. I need you to tell me where it's at, says the boy with the blue tattoos into Lalo's ringing ears. He grabs Lalo by the neck. Lalo coughs deep and raspy from the diaphragm. 
He looks at Quao finally. Quao looks away. Where's the money? The boy asks Lalo, tired and aggressive, as if he's asked him a thousand times before. Lalo swallows his own voice. Where's the money? Where is it? Who has it? Tell me, says the boy, with a cool, unnerving calmness, a whisper, a plea. Tell me. Where is it? Where is it? Lalo's eyes stay open, even beneath the water. They only close right before a giant pink glug escapes his lungs and clouds the tub with a roiling boil. Lalo's hand grasps the sides of the tubs. His index finger points at the boy, then the ground, then Quao standing by the doctor. The doctor waits a beat or two and then raises his hand. That's enough, he says. The body is still. The doctor rubs his eyes and puts a plastic device over Lalo's mouth that makes him puke up water until his teeth chatter, until the color returns to his lips. You'll get us those names, says the little man. He leaves the bathroom and Quao and Lalo are left alone. Everyone knows what Quao knows already. Lalo's eyes are still dilated wide, the adrenaline in his veins faster than the cortisol. Don't say anything, says Quao to Lalo. And Lalo nods his chattering head. Lalo points his index fingers to the mirror over the sink. And Quao looks up at it, presses his thumb to the glass to check if there's a space between his thumb and its reflection. It's flush, a two-way mirror. Quao turns off the lights and lights the votive candle over the toilet with a single match left in his ruddy matchbook, St. Rita. Quao places the candle between him and Lalo. He produces two crushed Fado cigarettes from a soft pack in his breast pocket and puts one behind his ear, puts the other at the corner of Lalo's face, the bent cigarette jumping up and down, up and down with Lalo's chattering jaw, little flecks of tobacco fall from the end of the cigarette and rest on the surface tension of the water. How long has it been since you've eaten? Quao asks. Long, says Lalo. What do you want? Quao says. He rubs his eyes. Please, says Lalo. Chinese food? Please. That's good, says Quao, lighting his own cigarette from the flame of St. Rita's candle. The smoke casts shadows on the wall. That's good, he says again, and takes Lalo's cigarette by the filter to light it with a cherry of his own. He places the cigarette back into the corner of Lalo's face. It's wet, so it burns better at the top than it does at the bottom. Lalo takes quick puffs to keep the fire from going out. His mouth fills with hot smoke. He coughs and coughs, unable to get a breath. To Quao, it's the saddest thing he's ever seen. In the bathroom, Lalo busts his chin on his way toward the porcelain lip of the toilet. He hurls and hurls, his voice splattering echoes inside the toilet bowl that rattle out of the tile corners of the ceiling and ping with a long wang, like the tight coiled racket of a kicked doorstop. Nothing comes up. A beaded string of spit arcs from the fleshy part of his lip to the clear water below. Quao hooks his arms under Lalo and pulls him up so he's kneeling. His chin sluices bright red. It meanders in streaks like jagged lines that dry maroon, brown, black, and then stops at his collarbone. He looks as fragile as an egg and just as pale. That incredible voice, that incredible noise. Don't talk, says Quao, don't speak. And he takes the Chinese food from the ledge of the bathtub and places it on the floor. Don't eat, he tells Lalo, who tries his best to be a good sport about the whole thing. They look at the mirror and then look at each other. They see themselves, Lalo, the boy he used to be, Quao, the man he might become, the bloody mess, that pulp of a person. He looks at Lalo the way you might look at a car wreck, the way you might observe it and rubberneck because you don't want it to happen to you. He observes Lalo begging, Quao swears when it's his time that he won't beg. Please, says Lalo, shivering in his cold clothes. Please, he says, reaching for the food, and Quao lets him have it. He nibbles at the breaded chicken. He can't keep anything down. Inside the tub, the ashy cigarette from Lalo's lips snuffed and bloated at the filter. It spins slow under the drippy faucet. Quao takes off his shirt and ties it like a scarf around Lalo's neck. He pats him dry with the tail of it. He grabs him by the shoulder and blows out the candle. The sodium lamps pour in through the window and light up half the tub orange. In the dark, the other half is blue. 
Lalo's skin is yellow, his torso cut in half. The water is green, the same shade of green Quao remembers so well from his childhood. He eases Lalo's head into the water and closes his eyes. Lalo wraps his legs around Quao, and Quao lets his mind drift back in time. The warmness of Lalo's escaping breath, like Texas heat in the summertime. Quao lets his mind go elsewhere. He imagines walking barefoot in his old backyard, or what he considered his backyard at one time. It's where he played anyway, him and his little brother. It's still teeming with sounds, the tick of the heat in his ear, the tick of the insects flapping pell-mell from one tree to the other, ruining everything he's ever worked for. Behind his closed eyes are the cicadas, too. Seventeen-year-old cicadas humming pitch perfect in the shade of the orange tree branches. You can't see them, but they're there. And they'll die eventually, like all the other critters and crawlers and men and women in the grove, all poisoned by the pesticides. Lalo moans and Quao brings his toes to a point. He's flexing his calves. He's bringing his body up two or three inches to the tree. He pulls down a switch and plucks a cicada from the branch. He pinches its humming legs between his fingers and it dangles and dangles it away from his face as far as his arm can reach, staring at his molting body. The cicada feels the same way it did when he was seven, the last time he handled the cicada, like a sliver of metal but undeniably alive. He remembers how they'd make them fight, him and his brother, how he'd clip their wings and set them off against each other in a dirt ring like oversized ants. Being flightless made them hostile. They circled for a long time before they attacked one another. They made them carnivores, him and his brother. I was always Lastly, his little brother watched as one cicada would split the other open, the broken one's exoskeleton sloughing off like flaking bits of fish food, and they'd talk it over just like teenage boys might talk over cigarettes, or men might talk over dialysis at the Harlingen Scott and White down the road. What is the worst way someone can die? His little brother would always come up with the funny deaths. Ants, getting killed by a hooker, getting killed by ants, and a fire, and a hooker at the same time. When it was Quao's turn, all he could think about was shriveling to death, sloughing away like that bug, molting, beautiful, and iridescent like the cicada drying in the dirt. What a slow death, he thinks. How cruel children can be. He thinks of the cicada, and thinks of the drivers, and thinks of Lalo, and thinks of himself, disposable, just like everything else. He'll molt under hot dirt eventually, somewhere in the world. In his mind, he can only see their skin sloughed off by zip ties or bullets or fire. He's suddenly conscious of his own scars all over his body. The puckered red blips of skin around his wrists from when he was zip tied and kidnapped in Piedras Negras. The pink laceration over his arm when he was made to fight gladiator style at midnight. The serrated bead sutures across his clavicle from when he crashed a plane for the first time with his brother. He opens his eyes and sees the face underwater, perfectly still, perfectly at peace. He imagines plucking each scar from his body to lay them over himself. He thinks he can remember what it felt like to be flawless at one time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Safe home. Um, maybe yeah, safety is a theme. Home is a theme, obviously, in this yeah. work. And a short story, which, uh, you won the Pushcart Prize. Thank you. Uh, so really recognized uh, internationally for for its for its power. Um, tonight we want to talk about your writing. We want to talk about sort of the environment, migration, social issues, and coming through your work. And it's a beautiful piece with which to set that up. Maybe I'll start with a question about, in reading Safe Home for tonight, you can feel the power of nature, the role of nature uh, in your story, and the way you talk about cicadas and the desert wasp and the safe house, yeah. uh, the part you didn't read here necessarily, but the, the, these details that you put in there. And my impression is that nature really flows between Mexico and Texas here. There's real no sense of, Maybe you can help us understand what role does nature play as a backdrop or as a central element in the way you tell story 
uh, in this context. Yeah, I think you know, I don't want to sort of I want to sort of want to take you know sort of authorial intent out of it, but I think Quaut Demock, the character, um, it definitely obsesses a lot over uh, nature and the way that pesticides, particularly. Um, in the groves in South Texas, these orange groves that, you know, uh, they spray chlorpyrifos. That was like his, that's how he learned to fly. It was his job. He was a crop duster. And so the, he's sort of throughout the novel, there's these ruminations about um, not only his, the way he's physically being poisoned and this sort of like, um, you know, the, the, the thing with chlorpyrifos is everyone's like, oh, you're going to get cancer. But and for him, he's like, you know, what a luxury to get cancer. <laughs> you know? Like to live that long that you can actually get cancer because he's like, uh, Every day is a struggle. Every day is survival for him. And so um, I like to play with that theme. And I think Quat Demok thinks about that a lot. Um, uh, poisoning, being poisoned, you know, on a biological level. Um, and also sort of being poisoned sort of in the soul, that kind of way. Not to get too, like, oogie boogie about it. But I think those things, he's, he's very conscious. His sort of, his subjectivity, he's always thinking about um, nature in that way. And poison. And... Um, antidotes, but also the way things like, by the very nature of the way we live, you know, it's, it's, it's destructive, you know. Yeah. And, and along those lines, in terms of relationship to the land, like you pointed out, I mean, Kuala and Lalo are talking about farming and relationship to the land, and Lalo in the story makes yeah. fun of Kuala for wanting to be in farming and yeah. sort of, it seems like you're exploring a little bit there, sort of social relations and status and nature and the relationship to nature. Yeah. I think I think for for Guatemoc, like the horizon is always like kind of like you know each of us have this like artificial horizon about like this that's that's the most we can get out of life and that that and, you know we do that to ourselves but this sort of like the farm is uh, it's 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 at once a symbol of like that's his horizon like man that's he just wants to have like a piece of the grove and there's a sort of like you know the culture of you know buying property in in, in the United States sort of like your like build your own hermit kingdom kind of thing. But I think that's where um, he finds peace is this idea of like, I can own this, this piece of land and sort of go back to the nature kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, and if I understand correctly, I mean, owning land also in, in Mexican society is also a similar yeah. status and, and achievement. And I come from California, and yeah. that's a big theme about working in California, but buying land in, in Mexico for family and things like that. Yeah. And what, what you, at least strikes me is, is the contrast between but one of the things we want to talk about is migration mobility, the notions of different types of mobility that are at play in your story, right? I mean, yeah. between obviously narco and the cartel uh, as one model that people either forced into, like Cal, yeah. uh, like Cal, or I don't know really how Lalo gets into the cartel business, if he's forced into it or if he's if, if he sort of yeah. decides that's a way for me to make money. Yeah. Um, but th this issue of, are you playing with that at all? Sort of different ways that people are looking between the United States and Mexico and mobility, socio-economic and in terms of status? Oh, no, yeah. You have a really good narrative instinct. That's like, like Lalo and Quao are sort of, I mean, that's the connective tissue is this, this, this concept of land and ownership and things like that. Um, uh, in the novel, you know, at large, Lalo is essentially, um, Lalo's story is that he, his parents own, there was like, what you have to know about sort of like the history of Mexico is that, after, after the revolution, they had these sort of like um, haciendas that they sort of parceled out, you know, sort of into different parts. And it was supposed to be a really progressive thing, this communal thing. But these parts of land that were sort of parceled out were a lot of times in really rough areas of the country where there were no utilities. There was no, um, you know, uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty arid. A lot of it was in the, in the, in the far north. And so Lalo's whole family experience was building this sort of um, dairy farm in the north of Mexico. And when NAFTA happens, you know, 90s, um, you know, he can't sell, he can't compete with, with international milk. And so his, his hacienda sort of collapses. Mm -hmm. And so these cartels sort of capitalize on that when they say, oh, there's a lot of these people, a lot of valuable uh, young men who have nothing to do. And uh, you want a job, you want to save your farm. And so that's how Lalo sort of comes at it and gets into it. Um, but Lalo is sort of like the photo negative of Quao in that um, still very much connected to the earth, connected to nature, connected to um, the idea of sort of like land ownership and that kind of stuff. But um, the thing that really, um, you know, Lalo is, has been in the cartel for a long time and, and Quao is sort of this new He's guy. forced into it, right? Yeah. He's kidnapped as you. As you yeah, he's a pilot and so he's, um, he has that useful skill. What's happening, and this is, this is happening in real life, 
is the Juarez cartel um, is sort of losing, um, you know, a lot of people say it's, they're competing for money, but they're, what they're really competing for is roots, drug roots into the United States. And so uh, the Juarez cartel, it's, it's contracting. It's not like it used to be a really powerful cartel. Um, and it's, it's, the book is about this cartel essentially, uh, and it's a cell of this cartel. It's not necessarily the cartel at large, but it's a, it's a fictional, fictionalized cell that they say uh, we cannot, this operation, this cell is not sustainable. The only way we're going to make money is if we find a pilot uh, to, to, to do this stuff directly. We lost this drug route, this major route in the United States. We have to fly the product over. And so when they find out that Kwa was a pilot and he speaks perfect English and he can fly an American plane, um, with, an, with a, each, each sort of plane has like a different tail number. So in Mexico, it's like, you know, X5400 Juliet or something. And in the United States, it's N. So if you could paint an N and you have a, an American transponder, an American accent, you can get away with a lot in Mexican airspace. And so that is uh, sort of the quow where, um, yeah, he, he gets in. But he's, they kidnap him, they find out he's a pilot, and that, that becomes, you know, really crucial in the novel. I mean, you... you you address this notion of, of Mexican airspace, American airspace, borders, if you will, and mobility with yeah. this lovely scene where you talk about U.S. officials and the Mexican officials are watching the plane, yeah. but with sort of different, different sort of approaches to watching the plane crossing the border, and, and they know obviously what it's about, right? Yeah. And so, and you talk about planes, but you also talk about cars and or trucks and the routes that they have all the way up in, even to Canada, and this notion that yeah. you know, the cartels, when they want to move things, Borders become a relative thing, and of course, that's a contemporary theme. And many yeah. have said this notion of a new wall is ridiculous because the cartels yeah. are entrepreneurial. Yeah, you can't um, stop globalization. You can't stop. You can't is stop. That, is that what you're trying to say a little bit there? <laughs> you, can't, the mobility? you can't stop capitalism. It's just gonna just just gonna put it. The thing with like I don't know with uh, it's an interesting time right now. I, I will have time to get into that discussion like with with uh, the the border wall and Trump and this stuff and it's. Um, when systems fail people, they create their own systems. And it's, it's fascinating how people think they can put a wall up or something and it's gonna stop them. That's just not the case. That's never been the case, like historically. Um, and so I'm, I'm really fascinated with, uh, with not only that and sort of the, the rhetoric right now, but like in, within the novel, how um, it's, it, the whole novel is about that, how um, you know, the talent that we deport and the way that they get involved in these black market economies, these systems, that when the system fails them, they create it, or they become in, in sort of involved in a, a new system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Maybe I'll take that to ask one more question before we ask our colleague, Albert Shvei from, from, from Potsdam to join us to talk about the environment and, and, and literature. Um, along that line, when you talk about sort of this ingenuity and systems and, and, and creating things, one of your blog contributions and plowshares you relate this wonderful story about receiving advice from, from fellow artists or editors about not necessarily to write about the narco industry in, in Mexico, you know, in the sense of figures and, and, and symbols. And your reply was, we have to talk about these yeah. things if we want a certain fluidity and complexity and everything. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, no, um, essentially what, what had happened was I had, I had written this piece um, that was actually sort of, ref it was, uh, you know, briefly mentioned the sort of the connective tissue here, which was like this gladiator style fight that Quao, the, the, um, the character had to go through. And this is a real thing that happens um, uh, when, when people are deported, uh, depending on which city they're deported in, but um, there are people waiting for them on the Mexican side of the border. Uh, and they, the whole, you know, these small cells and these really sort of base cells, they, they want ransom. They say, okay, we're going to kidnap these people freshly deported. Do they have American family? Can we call them up, get quick money? All right, you're gone. Um, but there is this sort of like, I mean, this was, this was exposed by, I'm forgetting which news outlet, but there's, these, there's this gladiator sort of like, they take them to like a bullfighting rink and they have like modern day gladiator fights in this bullfighting rink with, um, people who can't, they can't get money from them and it's sort of like this really dark entertainment. And it was a story that fascinated me. I felt really sort of compelled to write about it. Uh, and I put it in the novel and I sent it out. They took it. They were like, this is great. Um, a, a magazine who shall go unnamed. <laughs> and then, and then they, uh, it got to like, like months before publication and they're like, we can't, we can't do this. And I was like, well, really? I was like, like it's just not, you know, and they, the, the, the thing that, it was a Latino editor who, who took it down and was like, yeah, this is offensive to the Latino community and this is offensive. But I, and I have a lot of empathy for that um, because I think, you know, uh, her, her, her sort of um, 
argument was that she didn't want to sort of show Latino people in that way as the narco, as the sort of, um, you know, the bandito or whatever. Um, and I have a lot of empathy for that sort of argument. But, you know, I always go back to that James Baldwin quote, is like, you don't see because you don't want to see. And if we don't acknowledge these sort of things that are happening, you know, it's like, what's more offensive, you know, that like, you know, that, that I wrote about it or that you can't look it in the eye. You can't look that truth in the eye. And so um, that's one of these things where I feel like, no, that's, it's real, it's real and it's happening and it's been reported on and um, I don't know, I think, I think the writerly way to sort of tackle that and to tackle it tactfully, um, and you can do this with, with anything and, and write about anything, is you have, to do, you have to give the character dignity, you know? It can't be sensationalist in that way, it can't be a cheap story. And so uh, that's one of those things um, that I'm always balancing, how to, how to tackle the Mexican drug war in a, in a way that shows the dignity in character and not like sensationalized it. It's really tough. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, in Safe Home, I think you do that spectacularly well. There's a, there's oh, a tension, <laughs> and there's a power, and there's a thanks. pop to the language that uh, makes it hard to actually stop reading, to be honest with you. I think it's oh, enormously successful in terms of that. Thank you. Jakob, do you want to join us up here? I can introduce you and we can sort of run the conversation a little bit. Um, so for tonight we were thinking, and this was Frederica Busch from the uh, Post Playing Verlag Forum's idea, is to have a broader conversation and bring in some other expertise in terms of the environment and, and, and migration and, and thinking about issues that we'll talk about bringing back to Houston where, where you're residing yeah. now as part of sort of your home. And it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Jakob Scheve, who's at the Potsdam Institute uh, for Climatic Studies. And if you know anything, follow it all, sort of climate studies, you'll know that's a world-renowned institution, a leader in research uh, in terms of climate change. Um, and Jakob um, earned his PhD at the same place and has published extensively, is a, an expert who's uh, tapped uh, worldwide. He writes a lot about environmental change and the relationship between environment, environmental change and food supplies, if you will, global food security, uh, monsoons, global change, uh, food, social implications, and not the social side so much, but the relationship between food security and, and social dynamics. And really in many ways is an ideal partner for us up here to talk about these things in terms of environments, mobility, yeah. social inequality, violence that can emerge from that and other issues like that. So Jakob, uh, welcome and let's give Jakob also a nice round of applause. Yeah. Jakob, maybe I'll uh, sort of broaden the conversation a little bit. You know, we've heard um, here in terms of in terms of nature or the environment and economic choices and even violence that emerges from that. Um, in your research, these are sort of broadly some issues that you look at. What have you been seeing in your research between environmental change or the environment? Um, notions of economic security and food security and what that does to societies. Thanks uh, for the question and, and thanks a lot for having me. And I think this is really a, an exceptional format for someone like me to join a conversation with, um, with Daniel and, and you guys. Um, so, and, and I have to say, like, I'm, I'm, I've been, I'm, I'm quite moved by your story and it's... Uh, Thank you. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a step to now move from such a personal um, human account to something as broad and, and in, in a sense much more abstract, of course, and, uh, like climate change. Um, on the other hand, now that you mentioned um, violence as a, as a keyword, there's, there's actually been studies relating violence of all sorts to, to ambient temperature and oh. by extension to climate change. Wow. So actually there's, there's a real risk that just like leaving away or leaving aside all the other impacts of climate change just due to the warming alone, wow. people might get more aggressive if you will, there might be more domestic violence, interpersonal, intergroup violence. <clears throat> so that's quite scary uh, and that's one of, one of quite a few impacts of climate change I would say that are under-researched so far because we don't necessarily have good models for these things, right? We have quite, I'd say, good or, or at least 
well, develop models for things like uh, food crop growth, uh, for water resources, for um, ecosystems, at least, at least on a larger scale. Those are things we've been looking into for some time and we know a little bit about how, how those might react to climate change. But then when it comes to humans, um, you know, we're such complex systems as, you know, the single human body and, and mind, but also um, groups and societies so complex that it, they're really hard to, hard to you know, model and, and predict. Nonetheless, there is evidence like this study that I mentioned, but also other studies that, that uh, you know, there are really some risks associated with this global climate change that we, we, we might be underestimating still. Another is, uh, you mentioned uh, the economy, so, you know, what, what ultimately the effects will be of climate change on our economy as a whole, I think hasn't been quite understood yet, because we, we just understand the bits. Um, of the impacts in some of the sectors, like we understand, you know, again, impacts on the agriculture sector, impacts on all those natural resources, um, maybe on, on, you know, uh, transportation when it comes to, you know, bringing emissions down, of course, that requires a lot of um, transformation in the transportation sector, so lots of economic implications. But I think there's much more to it because, because uh, of all the interactions you have in the, in the economy as a system relating humans to each other. Um, so, yeah, without, you know, getting into a monologue here, but just saying that I think oh, that's a wonderful opening. Yeah. And maybe, wow. maybe I'll follow up with that and we'll build a bridge back to Houston. Yeah. And, and as I was saying in your introduction, quite a bit of your research deals with climate change, monsoons, uh, sort of, yeah, violent weather or extreme weather, I don't know what phrase we like to use, and, and then issues of sort of economic impact in terms of food supply, for example, and, and inequality. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that research, what you see in the relationship between weather change, climate change, monsoons, and then sort of what you see, not necessarily the focus of your research, but its impact in terms of social equality or inequality and human mobility and migration, right. things like this. I, I, yeah, I would say that social inequality and social injustice is, is, is probably a um, key um, thing and term that connects also the, you know, the all the things that you write about in, you know, with the drug war and the, and, and the, um, uh, the oppression that's happening of, of minorities in, in countries and so on, and, and climate change, which um, in the end is also just a big social justice issue um, with probably a few important uh, distinctions to things like, you know, things we've been talking about, namely that, that it's really, you know, you have this one control variable, greenhouse gas emissions, yeah. that you, you know, you could just turn down and ease, ease a lot of problems all over the world. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so just one example I was mentioning earlier when we talked is, is that we did a study on, on uh, food price changes in response to, um, to changes in, in, in food production. Now that sounds a little bit obvious that, you know, if you, you have uh, bad harvests somewhere in the world that might, you know, affect prices. But um, we've really shown that um, these uh, large food price spikes that we've seen in, like about a decade ago, I don't know if, uh, if everybody's aware of that, but there, in 2007 and 8 and 2010 and 11, there were two large spikes in global food prices. And those were so severe that really millions of people in developing countries were pushed into food insecurity, at least temporarily. And so, of course, the question arises, um, you know, how, how do these spikes happen? Why do they happen? And, uh, and how can we avoid them happening in the future? Um, especially when climate change threatens to increase the fre frequency of, of extreme events like droughts, which threaten the crop harvests. So we're looking at, you know, if there is an increase in drought in, in some of the major food baskets around the world under <coughs> climate change, then how does that change the risk of such um, price spikes to happen and thereby, you know, challenge to, to food security? Maybe I'll use that analysis, thank you very much, to weave it back into Houston a little bit. And, and Daniel, a, a blog entry you had up with Plowshares uh, that you told me you were all supposed to read tonight. And yeah, as I told you, yeah. yes, 
and then your Twitter account, and yeah. I was able to tell you actually right before you told me to That's read awesome. it. That's so awesome. Uh, thank I you. Did some homework. Uh, reading Baldwin after Harvey: Why climate change is a social justice issue. And we explore that, and, yeah. so, and you raise the question: Does Harlem 1943 have anything to do with Houston and Harvey 2017? You said absolutely in terms yeah. of dynamics. Uh, and looking at the violence of the weather event in, 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 in Houston, but what it really pushed back or reveals in terms of access to food security or social security on the streets. You want to talk about that a little bit? How you see yeah. Baldwin in Houston and sort of the theme that we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to thank you for that research. That's, an, that's been fascinating stuff. That's like a lot of really interesting ties um, to, yeah, stuff, stuff that we're thinking about. Well, like, you know, Baldwin's writing in that I'm writing about Baldwin, writing about the 1943 Harlem riots, in which uh, there's a white policeman who killed a black soldier uh, who was coming home from war. It sparked these Harlem riots. And there's a quote in this essay, it's called, it's, it's a really canonical essay, no, it's from a native son, in which Baldwin writes, yeah, I'd never seen such obscene amounts of wealth on the streets. I never, when I think of Harlem, I never thought of it as wealthy. And he says that there's blankets and stuff strewn around as if somebody had just like ran away and like forgotten them or something. But, you know, when I was teaching this, and I was teaching that essay immediately like, and I didn't plan it this way, uh, in the immediate aftermath of Harvey, my students were uh, likening that sort of image, blankets strewn everywhere, stuff, just stuff everywhere, to the streets uh, quite literally surrounding the campus, you know, where people had to sort of put everything that they owned, you know, on the curb. And they were sort of drawing this parallel between um, you know, the, sort of what Baldwin says, which he sa talks about, he's like, I never thought of this neighborhood as wealthy, but it, it's white wealth, right? And it was wealth that was sort of the, the riots were, the, it was white shops that were targeted. Um, and it was sort of, my students sort of rounded the curve where they were like, well, you know, like who, who profited off this storm? Who profited off of, you know, the fact that we have to put all this shit out on the curb? Who built the attics in the Barker's Reservoir? Who gave the permissions to have land built in these sort of floodplains? Uh, you know, which, which energy companies are like directly responsible for climate change in Houston? It's a lot of them, and they're all downtown. Um, but my students were, were really critically thinking about this, and it was really interesting to sort of teach that essay in this moment, because I would have never linked Baldwin to climate change, but it was sort of, in my mind, it totally you know, convinced me that this is, this is indeed a, a social justice issue. Um, it's like 33 trillion tons of water. That's like a, like, I think the statistic was it was like a foot of water for the entire state of Arizona. That's how much water fell on Houston. Um, that's bananas. That's like, you know, like nothing like that. You know, this is like 60 inches of rain, which is, I don't know, like two and some meters, something crazy like that. Um, so a lot of people are going to say, you know, they try to write it off like this is a, you know, this is a climate change issue, or the fact that these people bought in these uh, floodplains, that's a zoning issue. Uh, but these things are inextricably interlinked, and um, I think, you know, for those reasons, it's, uh, you, you have to look at it as a social justice issue. One of the things you say about that, you know, just sort of building on your, on your analysis at the end about possible other explanations for, for, for monsoons or Harvey and hurricanes and extreme weather and trying to understand these events is, See, so in the process, language becomes weaponized. Talk yeah. about that, weaponizing language. Yeah. And sort of, can you help us, you know, explore yeah. that a little bit with us, you know, the relation between what you're looking at? I mean, the piece you said that, joined, that, that binds Baldwin with, with Houston yeah. is, as you said, both events, if you will, yeah. expose fault lines in your language, right? Yeah. And then as these fault lines are exposed, at some point in the process, language becomes weaponized. Can you I mean, us understand that a little bit? There was this weird, there was this weird event that happened like immediately, right before the storm, where um, the mayor, Mayor Turner, was like, "Stay in place." This is a really controversial decision. What he didn't want was like a Katrina situation where people are stranded on the highway and then the storm hits, and then what happens? So he told everyone, "Stay in place. It's going to be fine." It was not fine. It was not fine. But it, we stayed in place. But there were news crews, and I, I live in downtown Houston. I'm lazy, so I like to live like really close to where I work. And so I live in downtown Houston, and I work, I walk to, to work. And uh, we so happen to live in, right by the George R. Brown Center, which was the major sort of uh, area, the staging center that they were bringing refugees to. 
and there were news crews like you know everyone you could think of you know uh, CNN and you know the whole bit or they were just interviewing people on the street like why why are you staying are you um, you know don't you have any uh, sort of feeling of responsibility for your family and it was it became this weird thing like um, they started getting really increasingly aggressive as the storm came it's like are, are you dumb like why are you staying and it's like we stayed because you know um, we were told it was going to be fine. That's that's the short of it. And uh, I'm new to Houston, actually. I grew up in Austin, so I have no experience. That was my first hurricane. Uh, it, was, it was a terrible hurricane, I guess. <laughs> it was like the, the worst first experience. But, you know, there are people who literally cannot afford to leave. They can't afford the gas to get up and go. A lot, that was a lot of my students. And uh, it sort of puts the onus on the people, like, what did, why is this happening to you? What did you do that you were the victim of this storm? Like, why did you not take responsibility for getting out of the way? And that's just another one of the sort of ways in which uh, the climate change can become weaponized. And you can sort of, you know, the people who sort of are really invested in sort of exculpating that guilt from them after the storm. Um, I mean, it, it's a longer conversation, but that translates to money in a lot of cases. That translates to a lot of things. That, um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was bizarre. One of the things you also say in the piece about Baldwin in, in, in Houston, and I'll use that to pose a question to you, Jacob, is one of Baldwin's points is with Harlem in 1943 is these events make it much more difficult to look away. Yeah. Uh, to look away. And that's one of the things that you try to really problematize in terms of Houston and Harvey and social justice. Yeah. And that would be my question to you, Jacob, in terms of the Potsdam Institute is also a public actor, it tries to raise awareness about the relationship between climate change migration, social justice, things like food security example. What is your experience? Where do you see this global debate right now? We just had this big uh, conference in Bonn to try to aware awareness between these issues. What is your assessment of the global conversation around these issues? Are we seeing more awareness or are people determined mostly to look away and not see these connections? What's your, what's your analysis? Right. I, I think we've it really depends on, on the angle you, from which you look at it because, I mean, considering the relatively short time span between when this really became a public issue and now you could say we've actually made a lot of progress in terms of how people think about it and talk about it. You don't meet nowadays, at least here, about many people who, who don't, don't know about the problem, who don't see it as a problem. I, mean, I think most of the people are actually aware that it's a big problem and they are generally supportive of, of policies of, of combating it. Um, even though, you know, or despite the recent election which, which still had like a, I think a quarter of, of the people voting for parties that, that deny the problem, but nonetheless. Uh. Um, on the other hand, I mean, if you look at it from, from, from the, the urgency of the problem, then yeah, it's, uh, it's of course much too slow, the, the progress we're making. And in terms of the global negotiations, uh, I mean, Paris was really a breakthrough when, when the, basically all, the whole world agreed that, you know, we have to stay below two degrees. Um, and now we're in, in a little bit of a, I would say, on a little bit of a plateau where, where you know, the talks are really about the details of that yeah. agreement. It's not that interesting what's happening in, or what's happened in Bonn a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago. You know, it's for the experts. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not much, much interest for the, for the public there. Um, but I wanted to say, oh yeah, um, about, because getting back to your essay about, about Houston, I think it was the same that I read too, and, and something that I found interesting that, that you wrote in the, or that kind of I got from that essay was, was that um, sense of community that you conveyed yeah. in, that, um, in that essay about, about Houston and about yeah. the, you know, the people kind of stuck there during the hurricane, but also you know, earlier, yeah. and the role of poetry I think you also wrote about. Yeah. But so I think that you know, the sense of community is maybe something that, that would actually bring, bring not only the debate, but also our own you know, action um, readiness to take action would bring that forward because um, you know I think it's really about realizing our own um, yeah role in this whole thing both in both in you know being the 
at, at the cause of climate change. I mean, at least we, as in, in, in the industrialized countries, realizing our responsibility for, for the problem, but also seeing ourselves really as, as, as active agents in, in this game and, and, and thinking about what's, what's the world that we actually want to uh, shape for the future and taking an active part in that yeah. rather than just you know, looking at, at you know, the negotiations, what's happening there, mm, it's not that interesting, I'll yeah. carry on with my own life, somehow this is all happening around me and I, you know, I can't do anything. Yeah. Uh, I think get, getting more aware of, of, of our own role in, in the community, in the city, in the country, in the world, and, and realizing that it's, you know, we have a role to play, even if it's just actively supporting and approving of the policies that we need to, to combat climate change, or actively protesting the, the policies that, that you know, are, are the wrong ones, the yeah. ones we don't think. I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, that's a wonderful uh, observation. And now, since we I'll use that for a last question to you, Daniel, then we'll open it up to the floor so people can talk to you as well. This notion of community uh, and engagement and, and protest or activism, as a scholar and as a public actor in terms of the public conversation in Germany and worldwide about these issues, and Daniel, you know, you talk about that in your blogs, and one that I want to bring up is the one where you talk about weaponized language and having the right to write about certain themes, even though some people might not approve of that in terms of Latino <laughs> images and yeah. things like that. And you talk a lot about literature and, and being an activist through literature. And in the, that Plowshares blog where you talk about these issues, you talk about, you know, we need fewer binaries, we need more complexity, we need more bridges to allow a different type of conversation. Uh -huh. And so my last question to you is after Harvey, and in the context of many issues that are being sort of raised, do you see, what do you see happening along those lines where you think the agenda needs to go to talk about environment, social justice, Mobility. Yeah. Um, has the conversation changed in Houston around these issues? Or? I mean, I really, I mean, I wish I could say it has, but like our new, um, like the the czar that's in charge of like putting t the city back together again, is uh, this dude named um, man. I forget his almost like Marvin uh, Odom, who's this ex Shell CEO. Like, you're gonna you're gonna hire the guy who like was responsible for not only just sort of. And we haven't even talked about the petrochemical spills and all those things and sort of the, the Buffalo Bayou, but also the, the ship channel. Uh, but you're going to put the guy in charge of recovery efforts. Um, Houston is sort of famous for not having any zoning laws. And so a lot of these neighborhoods, and particularly on the east side of Houston, that have, um, are by the ship channel, are sort of, they're living amongst these sort of like petrochemical sort of ways in which when, when that stuff's not refrigerated, you know, the factor about like sort of that stuff seeping into the ground aside, which is like a terror all its own. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't see the they're putting these people who are sort of running these facilities and are actively in, engaged in maintaining that sort of non-zoning policy. And in, uh, in which when something like this happens, like a like a catastrophic uh, flood and power goes out three days and all these really volatile chemicals start going out into the atmosphere, um, you know, it seems like nobody's uh, nobody took that seriously. I remember when I came back from Houston, because um, there were no groceries, you know, and so like literally when we could find a highway to get out, um, we drove to Austin, got a giant cooler and brought groceries back. And it was interesting to go away from Houston and then come back for um, after a couple of days. And then I remember just opening the car door to, uh, to get out and just my eyes were burning. And just like this weird physical, I was like, what the hell is that in the air? That, you know, almost like sort of like a lobster. Like it was slowly released, you didn't feel it. Um, but these things that, I don't know, they, I, from what I've been reading, that, that keeps going to the same. The, the good thing though is that like, you know, I feel like, and we can't count on the Trump administration obviously pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord and, um, and that was a moment uh, in which everyone realized like, holy shit, this is going off the rails. This is, uh, I mean, that was the first sign of at least within his administration. I mean, there were plenty of signs before. <laughs> you know? Like, like this, is, this is dire. This is um, really dark. But last I'd read, and I don't know if you uh, heard this, Moody's, the credit rating agency, is going to start dinging cities that don't prepare. Because they say, you're, you're at risk, right? You cannot rebuild a city not... If, you're, if you have flooded in the past, and they've revised the 100-year floodplains, if, you um, if you're not 
you know, up to snuff with the standards that, uh, you know, you're, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're going to cut the credit, uh, your access to these resources. And so, um, I, I don't know, the optimist in me wants to have hope that, that the sort of superstructures of the things that we'll, we'll get it right. But on the ground, man, it's, it's tough. There's yeah. a long ways to go. <laughs> it's a long ways yeah. to go, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel and Jakob are at your disposal. So please, please ask questions or make observations. Not long observations, um, but you know, observations. Join the conversation. Please, the floor is yours. Gabby. Yeah, um, there's a, a, a tradition of environmental Yeah, I mean, I love those writers. Um, I don't know, it's hard to say, like, I, I think I'll leave that up to, like, scholars or whatever to do that. Like, to put me where I gotta go, you know? But, like, uh, I, I really touched that you think of me in, those, in, the, in that trajectory, that's cool. But yeah, I'll say yes, I, you know, like, you know, I'll own that. But yeah, no, I, I really, I, I really, uh, I think about that a lot. And I think this sort of connection to sort of you know, not to get too like back to the earth or whatever, but I think I think it's it's something that's it's that, that's arguably the besides Trump, that's arguably the biggest thing that's sort of the existential crisis that we're going through right now. So I think it's um, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about that larger trajectory of like American literature um, has it's been written about, but you know you, you don't get the urgency in in sort of American literature. But I think. Uh, it, like you're right, there is definitely a tradition of that in Mexican American literature, but I haven't, I hadn't even thought of that. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I might pick up on something on that and then bring in Yako into the conversation and, and, and maybe provoke just a gentle bit in terms of post dominance role in sort of the public debates about this. There have been studies looked at sort of popular culture and culture and literature and, and awareness of environmental change and, and shift, trying to shift behaviors, right? One of the conclusions is that certain types of literature, certain types of popular culture, especially that emphasize catastrophic scenarios, right? I mean, and, and if we don't change now in 10 years, we're gonna have a situation where we can't change anymore in 10,000 years. And social psychologists have looked into this and said that the feeling that comes with that is one that's so overwhelming that we as human beings are almost hardwired to look away when given such a despondent, immediate, overwhelming picture. It's just too much, we can't process it. So, you know, uh, if we don't change very quickly, the whole system is gonna change and they're overwhelmed. So like movies like The Day After, for example, they've asked people uh, how they react to that. So my question would be to Yakum in terms of that, right? We're trying to wait where, we're trying to raise awareness. We're trying to raise it quickly. Um, how do we do this in the sense of social psychology and human reaction to these stories in a way that makes the issue manageable in a way, in terms of individual stories and not such overwhelming structural stories? Uh, do you think about that at the, the Institute and sort of how you encourage different types of discourse about Anthropocene and, and other issues? And what does that mean for your work? And I would ask you and Daniel maybe to follow up in terms of literature. How do you address that to make it somehow accessible for people? Terms yeah. of, in terms of stories. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, our, like at Potsdam, our central mission is, is, um, is not to be activists and to kind of, I don't know, Your research get, institution. get ordinary people to, to do something, but, but we're really a research institution. And, and so that's what we really try to do as good, good as we can. And, and if the story is catastrophic, then. Um, I guess it's also our duty to, to tell it as it is. And I think that the primary audience for that is then maybe not you know, the ordinary citizen directly from science, hey, look, the world's going under, what are you gonna do? Yeah. But to, you know, go, go to the people who, who um, you know, making the decisions that, that, that can change something. So, so we talk a lot about, uh, we talk a lot with politicians, with uh, you know, people from, um, private sector as well, with um, educators actually, there's, there's a program at our institute um, designing material for teachers. So I think it's really, we're trying to inform those people that, that can then, you know, spread the message and, and make the decisions that need to be taken. And, and the people that, like, like, I think those people are 
more used to taking decisions under with that kind of information and not being scared away by you know oh, oh wow yeah. that sounds bad and you know <laughs> I'm going to think about something else. Yeah. It's their job to to you know deal with that kind of information. So I think that's important. And I agree that when you, when you you know when you talk about when you talk to non scientists and non politicians just to each one of us uh, as an individual, uh, then it, it, these accounts can be frightening. And uh, but on the other hand, I, I think it's also there's also value. So if you if you start you know, telling people what you think they want to hear, but it's not that bad. And you know, I'm just going to tell you the little bit that I think is is maybe going to affects you, you know, your backyard is, might get a little drier. Yeah. Um, if you don't give them a big picture, it's not really honest. Yeah. And, and when people realize that, then, then it's also not great. So, so I think it's, it's really important to tell the truth. On the other hand, I think it's really important to also develop visions for how it could be different. Yeah. And so, you know, how, how could we run our economy and our society in a way that, that would avoid these catastrophic outcomes? And that might also be desirable in different ways. And, and that's probably where both science and literature can play an important role in, in inspiring people to think about you know, different possible worlds, yeah. both at a personal level and, and as, at a societal level. And I think that's something that's potentially lacking in um, you know, our everyday conversation in the media and in, in how, how, how we talk about things. It's, very much looking from from where we are right now into the very near term future and near term past and thinking about how oh, okay do we have to change something why is it hard to change yeah um, and so I think that inspiration and that vision as as to you know how could it be different wouldn't it be nicer if you know this and that that that's really important yeah I would, I would very much agree I think narrative is is really, can, is really powerful you know it's like I also feel like you, like you know, the best narrative is like you can see yourself in the story. Like character is king. I think when you take something as, and for a lot of people, I, for it, for a lot of people, it is very abstract. You know, the, the the concept. But but you can you can measure it, and there are things, and it's 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 a weird moment in the United States um, in which people are not buying into even the stats, which is really troubling. But um, I feel like in literature, if you can sort of Make it palatable that like this is this this affects people on an individual level, and here's one story. I think that's one way to cut that. Um, we had this discussion in class the other day about you know we should, is that even literature's responsibility to kind of do that you know, and it's um, it's a really a, more of a philosophical question. Um, I, w I would say you know if, uh, you know literature does have some some responsibility to sort of at least. Show the dignity and, and aid dignity in the face of things like this. You know, some, the abstract. I think the best literature does that. Um, but in, in relation to climate change, I would I would say um, you know character is king. You know, when you look at Houston especially, and you look at you know, like I'll never forget. It wasn't real to me until you, when, the way hurricanes happen is like they'll they spiral and then they have bands, and so you know rain will fall and then really heavy and then for maybe an hour, it's not falling. And I remember when it wasn't falling, I would, I would go really stir crazy, I like to walk a lot. And so I went outside and uh, took a block just to survey the damage. And I saw like the building across me was burned down and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's crazy, you know, but it wasn't like, you know, like completely destroyed. And I'm like, okay, well, here's some other stuff and water coming out of the, the drains. And then I round the corner to Main Street, downtown Houston. And I saw a dead guy, like a just a guy who was just dead in the middle of the intersection on the uh, railroad tracks. And the train goes, takes me to work. And I remember looking at that and just being like, holy shit, this, the resources are stretched so thin. Who knows how long that guy's been there? Soaking wet. And uh, much to my shame, actually, um, uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel compelled to like, approach him or to reach out to anybody. I was just sort of being like, wow, this is so dire. I need to get back inside, like right away. Uh, and it's one of those things that, you know, as I was walking away, you know, it's sort of, you know, like cops were, it's Main Street Houston, cops found him eventually. But it was one of these things where I was like, oh, God, you know, this is, but those little things, like, you know, that's what made it personal to me. Wow, that, you know, that guy, 
who, who knows what happened, did, looked intact, was still for a long time. And just thinking like, you know, is, was it a medical thing? Was it heart attack? Was it, um, what was it? You know, and, and so I think, I think when we boil things down and we look at them through that lens and that subjectivity and being like, making it personal, that's, I think that's the way to, to cut these kinds of stories. Yeah, I mean, the power of that kind of story, the power of science and sharing that, I think, are, are ways that, you know, we can in encourage a different kind of conversation about these fundamental issues. Yeah. Daniel, Yaakov, thank you very much. Cool. Thank, thank you. Hi, so could you tell me a couple of remarks and uh, general ideas about the reading that you had? How did you feel about it? Yeah, so I thought it was a really interesting juxtaposition to have, have a literary reading followed by a conversation not only with the author but then also a, a scholar working on climate change and clearly the US-Mexican borderlands uh, are being affected massively by climate change and that intersection between culture and science seems to be the central way to begin to deal with those kinds of problems. So these sort of intellectual debates need to be happening and the fact that we could do it in such a nice space uh, I think is really productive for everybody that's here and then for everybody that can uh, watch the video later. Okay, thank you.